So to call Calvin Trillin a writer is a bit like calling Duke Ellington a piano player. I mean, strictly speaking, it's true, but Calvin, like Sir Duke, is so much more. A novelist, a humorist, a journalist. He's been called perhaps the finest reporter in America and has spent more than half a century telling insightful and funny stories about the people and the places that make up the American landscape, and Canada too, by the way. Calvin, born and raised in Kansas City, graduated from Yale, did a stint in the Army. Then in 1960, he joined Time magazine, where he wrote about the growing civil rights struggle. His experiences led to his first book, all about desegregation in the American South. 1965, he married his muse and his soulmate, fellow author Alice Stewart, and following her death in 2001, Calvin wrote a loving portrait of her called About Alice. In all, he's written close to 20 books, four of them about food, and he's got some pretty strong opinions on a dish close to many of our hearts and arteries. A regular contributor to The New Yorker for close to 50 years, Calvin, who spends his summers in Nova Scotia, has recently released a collection of his funniest pieces. The book is called Quite Enough of Calvin Trillin, and it shows just how far he's come. The first humor piece I published was in a magazine called Monocle. They were not big payers, Monocle. I um, sent them a piece and they accepted it and sent me a bill. Please welcome Calvin Trillin. How are you? Hi, Good to see you. How are you? Thanks. Bye. Uh, you're a thoughtful man, sir. Are you the kind of man that spends a lot of time reflecting? You mean like a reflecting pool, that sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, because the I book... Would say, I would say... No. 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 So uh, then when one has the opportunity to reflect on 40 years of funny right. stuff, what was that experience like? It was like, now there's too much of this stuff, and how am I going to find what, what should be in the book? Um, but, but it was enjoyable. Are those uh, decisions emotional, or are they...? I, I try to keep my emotions in check when I'm doing it, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not very emotional in general. I mean, this for me is sort of... This is sort of chewing the scenery for me. I mean, this is, this is, I'm right at the, my emotional edge right now. Right. This is, <laughs> this, is or this is as far as I go, George. And I make myself laugh, I bet, every, once every two or three years. And so if, if I were, say, a hostage, right. um, I would not be totally without resources. I could, I could get a giggle every couple of years. So. <laughs> Just if they gave me a little pen and, and, and pencil. Um, but you know, because you can't tell somebody, oh, that was funny. Right. It, it, you know, if the woman in the second row doesn't laugh, it's not funny to her. And you can't say, that's, I think, one of the reasons stand up comics are so neurotic, although not the only reason. Uh, you, you can't tell her, madam, in, in the previous show, uh, intelligent people such as yourself, laughed hilariously at that joke. She doesn't think it's funny. So, <laughs> so there's nothing you can do about it. It's indefensible humor. It is. The, um, part of it as well is, is tackling subjects that some people don't find funny. Yeah, often the people who you're writing, you're writing about. Right. Uh, don't <laughs> find funny. Have they ever Although, reached out to you? Well, they, they have. I find the politicians don't say much. I don't think they want to admit they've even read the stuff I write. But um, the animal people, are, are very vocal. By animal people, I don't mean people who were as babies thrown clear in a, in a plane crash in Africa and raised mm -hmm. by a pack of orangutans. <laughs> Not those kind of animal people. They generally have a wonderful sense of humor, I found. Those, the orangutans, yes. yeah, but not the people. Um, <laughs> um, the, but I mean people with uh, uh, a special concern for animals. Right. I mean, uh, Are you talking uh, about like groups like PETA or uh, animal or, rights advocates? Yeah, advocates or even just people with, with um, for instance, I said in a column once, I mentioned that, that corgis are a breed of dog that appears to have been assembled from the parts of other breeds of dogs. <laughs> um, and, and not the parts that those dogs were terribly sad about losing either. <laughs> and you'd be surprised how many cor corgi owners there are in the United <laughs> States. Uh, but uh, they're much more likely to write in or, or, to, or to attack me than, than um, politicians. Um, the, is it because sometimes you're actually tackling subjects that have impact, that matter? You know, and that, and that, that's one of the challenges of, of even satire. Right. Um, like terrorism jokes are... I, I watched a movie uh, that dealt with did terrorism jokes. I watched it in New York City. It didn't really go over. 
Well, I did, I, did a, I guess you'd call it a joke, uh, when, uh, when we had the, um, the so-called shoe bomber, remember him? Mm -hmm. um, and this guy was a, a, a true schmendrick, this guy. He was, he was described always as very suggestible. And, um, and he got on the plane and he had these, these fuses hanging off his sneakers and everything. He practically asked the flight attendant for a match. I mean, he was... Um, and my theory on the shoe bomber uh, was that there's one Arab terrorist in the world who has a sense of humor, uh, uh, Khalid the Droll. And, and he said, I bet I can get them all to take their shoes off in airports. So he got this guy to do this, and and I and I um, and I said in the in the piece, you'll know I'm right if the next guy they catch because of his mo is called the underwear bomber. <laughs> sure enough, they caught the underwear bomber. So uh, um, there was a little snap of that on television of my brilliant prediction. Right, uh, and my my then six year old grandson said. Babo said underwear on television. <laughs> <laughs> he got so, the joke. He got it, yeah. <laughs> My stock went way up. I'm like, take a while. I'll talk about this in a second. Oh my God, Harry Garrison. Yep. As you see, it requires very still air to do this, and we have a very good atmosphere today. Now that's a guy called Harry Garrison. For, for a bunch of people, they saw Harry Garrison on the Tonight Show. Tonight Show. What they don't know is that you're the reason he was on. I was the booker, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, I used to do the Tonight Show in what, what was sometimes called the author's ghetto the, at, the, at the end of the show. You've been on like 30 times? Yeah. And, and uh, uh, one night afterwards, we were at this sort of gringo Mexican restaurant across the way. And the guy who booked me, the kind of comic guy, said, Johnny's more in interested now in having more civilians, more non-show business people who can do something. And I said, well, I know a great smoke ring blower. <laughs> and, and, and the guy said, what's his number? <laughs> and so I got home, and I sort of forgot about it. And then I got a call from this booker, and he said, watch Friday night. I said, he's already booked? Said there's 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 starlets who have slept with thousands of producers trying to get on the Tonight Show. Um, they're all had to do sleep with you. They're old. That's right. That's right. Oh, they're old men by now. <laughs> there's they're old women. They're, and they and they, and, they, and you booked him in four days or something like that. And he said, just watch. Well, I forgot about it. I was busy and I forgot about it. And the next day I was having uh, lunch with a friend and he said, did you happen to see Carson last night? And I said no. And he said. It's the weirdest thing. There was this guy on the show trying to blow smoke rings. I said, did you say trying? <laughs> no. Well, they hadn't taken into account the ventilation system uh, in the studio. So Harry would say, uh, here's one ring in the middle of another ring, just air, just smoke, <laughs> smoke. And, and then to, here's one for you, Johnny, smoke. Uh, and. Um, so I called my friend who had booked. I said, well, I told you he wasn't much of a smoke ring blower. I said, charming guy in his own way, but not much of a smoke ring blower. And the guy said, are you kidding? He's going to be on the best of Carson for sure. And, and he was, yeah. uh, cause, because Carson was great with think, people who, whose act failed. You know, like the guy who had a, with something, but the two-stroke thing to start it didn't start. Right, they, yeah. uh, so, so he just kind of watched Harry as he did this. Harry went through his whole routine. With that smirk. He was the only guy I ever, I ever managed to book. I tried to get a guy on who stole watches and things just to see how he did it. <laughs> um, couldn't do that. Illuminato coming up. You and Adam Gopnik are going to be talking about Canadian That's food? That's right. This is my, this is my Toronto spring. Um, I'm, uh, I'm going to be, yes, on the Illuminato, which I thought was some sort of conspiracy, or is that the Illuminati? It's the Illuminati. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'm relieved at that, George. <laughs> I always come to you when I'm a little concerned about things. And what we, well, I'm happy to be here for you, Calvin. Thank you. Thank what, you. Uh, what will you be discussing about Canadian food? 
Well, I don't know anything past poutine, so I guess it'll be... <laughs> I don't know about Adam. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, he grew up here. He, sh he should know something. <laughs> He'll do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, that's right. Callum's going to host a panel with the uh, New Yorkers, Adam Gopnik, like we said. It's Toronto This June on Canadian Food. This is his book. Calvin Trillin, everybody. Great to see you. <laughs>